I, yeah, if you can close that door real quick. I've got a couple of announcements for us. Uh, this one is we're going to make things easy for our short-term memories. And so what I have here is I have a sign-up sheet that's got a pen with it and a clipboard and everything. Now, this is not Baptist guilt. This is not us laying Baptist guilt on you. This is us making it easier for all of you that intended to sign up to serve at the Harvest Festival, but just haven't remembered to do so. And so I asked Miss Bonnie if she would make a sign-up sheet that I could pass around. Don't if you just so you know, the men are getting one also uh, that uh, Pastor Ransom is passing to them right now. Uh, but that's what it is. If you weren't going to sign up, please don't. But if you were intending to sign up, I'm going to go ahead and pass this around so that we can get an accurate count, uh, and Miss Barb can. Uh, not getting more gray hairs in preparation for it. So um, there's that. Now the other thing, that's serious, but this next thing is a little bit more serious even than that. Uh, I rarely, if ever, now we do have recommended resources, uh, and we do at times encourage during our conferences or other things that, hey, this is a resource that we would uh, recommend, so to speak, but it's, it's pretty rare that you'll ever hear me do anything like what I'm about to do. And that is to tell you that I read this book about two weeks ago, and I am so beyond impressed with it uh, that we ordered all the copies that we could to get in for you all. But let me explain to you why. Of all the books I've read on parenting, uh, and so this is more specifically for our young families, the, the next book, and we've got multiple recommended resources, and they are. They're wonderful resources, and we still recommend them. I would say this is double my recommendation of any other book we've ever recommended on this subject. Uh, it is literally the best, most practical, uh, parenting, biblically tethered book that I've ever in my entire life read. And so uh, I just want to make you all aware of it. We did get the copies in. Uh, they're $12. But again, if I could tell anyone, if they're asking questions, if you're a grandparent and you have children who are asking questions, this book is probably one of the most proven, practical, biblically tethered books that I have ever read by far on this particular subject. It's called Eight Errors Parents Make and How to Avoid Them. Uh, it's not by an author I've ever read before. Uh, he is a pastor of a church in Mississippi by what I could read on the back of it. And um, yeah, and he is uh, maybe in Birmingham, so that might be Alabama, not even Mississippi. Uh, but anyhow, do what? But they are in the book stall. We're going to talk more about them in the weeks coming up. Uh, but I can only tell you, again, that this book, I'll give you just the eight error chapters. Michael Brock. Michael Brock. Uh, but again, it's just straight, and it explains some of the more difficult things that parents have wrestled with. Uh, and he just does so as one who's raised multiple children uh, to the age of adulthood at this point. And so he's not, he and his wife, uh, who it was basically his editor, it sounded like, uh, did not write this from a standard of what they hope to see accomplished. They wrote it from what they've been trial and error through their life, uh, laboring and, and attaching it to scripture. Uh, the errors uh, I'll give you really quick, uh, shifting blame, error two, low expectations, error three, a child centered home, error four, failing to discipline. Then he gives an interlude, uh, called it isn't too late. Error five, reasoning with your toddler. Error six, <laughs> neglecting your grade schooler. Error seven, disrespecting your teenager. And error eight, missing Christ. Uh, and I can only tell you again, I just rarely will you hear me say things like what I'm saying. Uh, if you've been at this church for any length of time, you know that I, I don't get up and say those kind of things. This book, as a parent myself and now a grandparent, says everything I want to say and says it better and then says some things I didn't even think to say and says them well also. So again, just want to put that before you. Uh, wonderful, wonderful resource uh, that I would encourage everyone that has children or has children who are having children that they want to know better how to help them with those things, whatever that looks like. And I didn't mean like children, like little children who are having children. I meant those of us who are grandparents and now have uh, children that are having their own children. Uh, it's still a great resource for us to, to help them with. So again, uh, that's there, and just wanted to make you all aware of it uh, this evening. All right, I'm going to pray, and we'll get started. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you so much for your grace. Lord, it is the central focus of our study these Wednesday nights, and Lord, 
it is certainly worthy of our focus. Uh, it is uh, the instrument by which you have accomplished every aspect uh, of all that we have to hope for and in in this life. Lord, apart from your grace, we would have nothing. Uh, and Lord, what a sweet reminder of the the work, the power, the strength of grace for the days that we face. And so, Lord, as we uh, open this book together tonight and consider these truths from your word, uh, as the author has put them together for us, Lord, we thank you uh, for this for this gift. Uh, and I thank you for these ladies and, and the men who are gathered across the campus. And Lord, I pray uh, that your grace would abound in our time of study. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Well, as you may have already heard, as I was talking a little bit with, with some of you before we started the class this evening, this is a chapter that will uh, take you a little bit below the surface level, uh, which, to be clear, if you've read Romans 5, Romans 5 is going to take you below the surface level. As you're walking through that, a little bit like what we've been seeing in Romans 2, we're dealing with Old Testament issues that sadly don't change into the New Testament. And we're seeing that truth throughout. So I'm exceedingly thankful for this chapter. I think the author did a wonderful job in explaining what is probably one of the most misunderstood truths from Scripture in a Christian's life. And that is, what exactly does our struggle against sin actually look like? How are we to fight against sin? What does it look like for a believer who has died to sin to then have to still fight against sin? And how does the scripture handle that? And how are we supposed to view that? I would say that this is probably one of the top three questions that I get most frequently as a pastor as it pertains to a Christian's life. And it's dealing with ongoing sin. It's dealing with the, the reality of I thought I was past this particular area of struggle. I didn't know this was going to still be a struggle. What does this mean that I am struggling? It's a common, ongoing subject. And this chapter does a wonderful job of making clear, biblically, how this functions. So with that, I just want to look uh, at a couple places. But on page 53 to 60, you have the theological foundations for our practical actions. And this is an important truth. I hope that we're starting to see, not only through this book, but just in general, through a being in, in teaching here within this body, it is our doctrinal foundations that shape our practical actions. We live in a time when so many people just want, give me the practical. Tell me, tell me the, the three things I can do this week that's going to that's gonna make God pleased with me. Tell me how I can have a better marriage and do so in, in five sentences or less. Uh, explain to me how to raise my children and don't make it too complicated because I'm really busy. I've got nine of them, right? Whatever it is, there's a continual and ongoing need or desire that we have of I don't want to deal with the below the surface level doctrinal foundations. Well, biblically, those are the only thing we have. In other words, if we're going to for my example, if I'm going to think through how it is that I am to be the head of my home, the leader of my wife and house, if I don't have a doctrinal understanding of Christ having accomplished that for his bride, then I have no basis for my marriage. And I will do so by my own strength and my own opinion until such time as they fail or they're insufficient to the point of me quitting. That is the nature of any person striving to do biblical things according to their own opinion or strength. None of us can do so. I have to have a doctrinal, foundational truth that says, this is why. For example, when it comes to areas like disciplining our children, if I don't have a biblical foundation that in fact a lack of discipline is a sign of hatred from a parent, it will not be sufficient in the age we live in with the constant pressure to see that differently coupled with our own fleshly struggles as we love our children as human beings, meaning that we have a struggle at times bringing discipline, especially when they're in a season when they need it more often than we want to give it, and there's that struggle that we face. If it wasn't for the truth of Scripture that explained to me exactly how and why and what would be lacking, with examples, isn't that amazing? That when you read through Scripture, suddenly you'll come to passages that talk about Eli's sons, 
and why they were in the shape they were in. Or you start reading about some of David's children, and especially ones who were rebelling the most violently against him. And it says it's because David never disciplined him. He never told him no. And here's the outcome of it. So you not only have the command, the imperative, but then you also have the illustrations and other things. And there's a measure where all of these things come to pass because of a right view of the foundation that God's given for it. It's amazing how many things we can trace to doctrinal truth if we just take 10 minutes and do so. And that's what we're going to do a little bit in this chapter tonight. But, for example, a lot of the struggles that we see today that are so outside the scope of what we would consider normal struggles that 10 years ago, whether a boy is a boy or a girl is a girl, 10 years ago it would have been never a struggle. It would have never been a consideration of, wow, I have to really teach my second grader why that's not true. Why it's not true that if anyone tells them that they can be anything they want, that that's not true. But do we actually understand why that's not true? Are we actually able to stand in the face of a culture that is declaring more and more loudly that it is true, more and more violently than anyone who opposes that is filled with hate? Are you able to stand and understand fully and explain to your child, this is why that's not true. This is how God made you, and this is why God made you that way. Doctrine is essential to everything that we strive to do, from keeping a schedule to being a husband, to being a man, to being a woman, to being single, to you name whatever situation. And if we don't have a doctrinal foundational rock that we can stand on and survey the things around us, we will go astray. That's just how we are. And the Lord, knowing that, he says, I'm going to give you plenty. I am going to tether you with enough anchors that you will have to close this in order to go astray. And so with that in mind, as we consider this difficult subject of what does it mean that we died to sin, when I know that I still sin, but I'm trying really hard and I'm doing better than I was, so now how do I view others who are in sin and all the messiness that comes with sin, understanding it through the lens of our faith is absolutely essential. And Paul does so with very doctrinal or theological terms. And that's what we see throughout this. Look at page 53. <clears throat> he gives us the basis of what we're going to see in this chapter in the middle paragraph at the bottom last sentence. He said, in this chapter, we will see how that it is true. That is, in what way God has delivered us from the dominion of sin and how we work out that truth in our daily lives. That God has delivered us. Now, I'm just curious, is that something that you would say that you've oftentimes wondered? Maybe personally for you in the midst of struggles, or maybe in others' lives, as you look at this, I don't understand why it's so hard. When you think through this idea of being delivered, to have victory over sin, we hear these terminologies continually, and yet, oftentimes, the victory that is displayed in the church is an underground victory. And here's what I mean by that. It's really no victory at all. It's just suppressed enough that no one can really see. It's a veneer put on that says, my life is great. I don't struggle in any way, and I'm going to fake it till I make it. But you can't do that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for a multitude of reasons. And great is the fall when it doesn't work and comes crashing down. If you've built that veneer around your home, guess where it's going to display itself? teenage children, right? There's going to become that point where it comes flashing out. The Lord tells us that with clarity. Be sure your sin will find you out. When you cover these things, they will come out. So for us to understand then, this is an important truth. What does it mean that through Christ or in Christ we have victory over sin? How do we, how do we view that? Does anyone want to take a stab at maybe a view of that? Um, you don't have to. I won't hold your feet to the fire, but I think this is a common area of struggle. I love the way he's built this chapter. If you're reading the book, and I pray that you are, I love the way that he's built this chapter up. If you remember, it was two weeks ago now because of the storm, but the last time that we were in this chapter three and in, in doing the study, we were walking through all the elements of grace 
right, to a degree that, that it's almost scary because we were giving such freedom and in, 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 in recognizing through the Pharisee and the tax collector that it's just not us, that the victory over sin is not found in us, the strength for that is not in us, and yet we're commanded in specific ways. And so he goes on on page 54, and he takes us back a little bit to the very first chapter, if you'll remember. We talked about those good days and the bad days by our own assessment, days where we feel that we're more pleasing to God versus days when we feel like we're less pleasing to God. And he gives this at the very top. He says, we will learn that through Christ's death on the cross, we are given the ability to live lives that are both pleasing to God and fulfilling for ourselves. Now, I just would ask you all, ladies, doesn't that sound good? Like, doesn't that sound like something amazing? And yet, is that the case, or do we have a clear understanding of that across Christianity? And he goes on, and he's going to deal with it from Romans chapter 6. Now, Romans chapter 6 is the place to go and deal with our victory over sin. And he does that exceedingly well walking through it. Because it's a longer chapter, I'm going to skip over some areas that are important, but try and hit the ones excuse me, that are most important. Turn with me to page 56. <clears throat> and he makes the statement in the second paragraph down. The first thing we note about Paul's statement, talking about Romans 6, that we died to sin and that his death has already occurred in the past. It is not something we should do, but something we've already done. And there's a lot of struggle with this. There's a lot of misunderstanding. I literally deal at times with people who have a wrong view of sanctification, <clears throat> and they believe that a Christian can reach a point of sinless perfection this side of heaven, that that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 6. Should we go on and sin that grace may increase? May it never be. And their expectation is that means that we can reach a place of maturity where sin is no longer a fight for us. And that's not biblical. That's not at all what's being said in this. And so at the same time, what does it mean? What does it mean that, that we've died to sin? What does it mean that because of Christ's death, we no longer ourselves submitted to, to, to sin? That Christ died and paid the penalty for sin, therefore we are set free from sin. What, what does that mean? And we can talk about it in high and lofty terms, but the truth is, what does it mean when the rubber hits the road and you didn't get much sleep last night because your baby kept you up all night, and on top of that, your three-year-old is acting like they forgot who you are in the morning? Like, does sin, does sin ever creep up on us unexpectedly? Do we suddenly find ourselves saying, where did that come from? What is that? Or do we justify it? And a lot of that comes from not having a, a going back to these truths recognition. And he's making the point, if you look at Romans 6, and again, we just don't have time this evening to go into depth in it beyond what he did. But if you look at Romans 6, his whole basis of our victory over sin, what is it? What is it? Jesus. But in what way? In other words, not just Jesus in a general sense. It's our union with Christ in his death. And he uses baptism as the symbolic view of understanding that we were baptized into his death. That that's what it shows when we go down into the water, the symbolism of those things. And so when you think through that, yes, the answer is Jesus, but the whole basis for our victory over sin is our union with Christ. Now, I think most Christians see their union with Christ as the basis for the forgiveness of sins. Meaning that because of Christ and his finished work on the cross, we can go to him for forgiveness and he'll surely forgive us, right? We see that, but it's not very often that our fight against sin is viewed as well as it ought to be through the lens of our union with Christ. And that's the basis of Romans 6, and that's what he's endeavoring to explain most fully here in this chapter that we're in. So again, this is a chapter... I would encourage you to go back to and regularly read for the foundations that are necessary in our daily fight against sin. On page 59 to 63, where we're going to be in just a moment, is where he jumps into the depth of that union with Christ. 
I would give us on page 57 a few things to understand. Second paragraph at the top, what does it mean to die to sin? What does it mean? To arrive at the answer, we have to first pursue what the expression union with Christ means. In exploring this term, we will discover that union with Christ involves far more than dying to sin, but the death to sin is one of the more fundamental results. And listen, as we go through this next section where he begins on page 57, union with Christ, I just want to say it's an important truth. You, let's think for a moment about what we're going to see in this. Look over at page 58. Just hold your finger on 57. Look at that little chart that's there. As we see that explanation that all of humanity is in Adam, but the smaller circle depicts that some of humanity is in Christ. Why is that important? What's a fundamental struggle of our generation that that's confronting right out of the gate? It, that's it, right? I hear that all the time. Right? We're, we're all children of God. Uh, no, not biblically, we're not. Not theologically, that's not accurate. We're, in fact, all children of Adam. That's accurate, and that has massive connotations on multiple levels, but we're not all children of God. There are those who are children of God, and it's only accomplished through one. In other words, adoption isn't really adoption if everyone's just naturally brought into it through birth. Adoption is a unique action accomplished by God through the gospel, period. And so in rightly viewing that, this, path, this chapter is destroying false mindsets that I hear continually from the world around us that, well, we're all children. God loves everybody the same. Uh, let's think about that biblically, shall we? Let's have a biblical conversation, which is what this chapter forces us to do. And I think that's an exceedingly important truth because if that God loves everybody the same, not only does that rob the unbeliever of any emphasis or imperative for them to turn from and turn to something, but what does that do for the believer? Okay, what's the point? And let's put it in better perspective. In your fight against sin, if God really does just love everybody the same and there's not a measure of God's special adopting, justifying love that's been set on you, purchased for you at the cross with the precious blood of Christ, what's the point? Do you see the distinction and how much just that little common phraseology hinders and harms the truth that we're called to follow, trust, and Because People say, well, why do we have to burst someone's bubble who's an unbeliever and thinks that everyone's God's child? I'm not necessarily interested in that, although there is a necessity to that. With this group, what I'm speaking of here is, do you understand if you don't view God's love for you poured out for you, you at the cross, you are robbing yourself of the impetuous to follow Christ day by day because he first loved you, you now love him. But if he really didn't first love you, but he really loved everybody the same, then why bother when everybody's under the same blanket umbrella and can do whatever their flesh desires? Why should I fight against my flesh? Why should I put to death earthly things? Why should I strive? And, and again, once we get to this level, most people are like, yeah, no, I, I understand that. But if we don't do so from the beginning and we let blanket statements like, God loves everybody the same, we're all children of God. If we let those statements stand without some biblical refutation, we lose the truth of adoption. We lose the truth of the precious blood of Christ. We lose the truth of him first loving us as the basis for our love for him. We lose massive truths about the gospel, which we just learned two chapters ago, is the basis that we preach to ourselves in order to pursue after these things. You can't let it go. You have to stand on these things. So, it's an important aspect for us to understand rightly our union with Christ. Here's one of the simple ways that we say it around here. God doesn't have grandchildren. God doesn't have grandchildren. This is an essential, necessary truth that we have to remind ourselves regularly in a multitude of ways. What Romans has been doing from verse 18 of chapter 1 all the way through verse 20 of chapter 3 is bringing the entire world, all of humanity, both the pagan, irreligious, immoral, and the conservative, uh, moral, 
uh, external person and the religiously active conservative moral person under condemnation and saying everybody needs a savior. If you don't think that's important, let me ask you this. Does anyone here know anyone who's a devout Catholic? Okay. How well will it go if you explain to them that Mary needed Jesus to be her Savior? Right? Let's just take a step back and understand all the things that are at stake. Right? When Paul brings the entire world and shuts every mouth in Romans 1, 2, and 3, he doesn't do it because he's mean. He's not doing it because he's frustrated with the, all the struggles that are going on. He's doing it because that's what the gospel does. It brings us before God in recognizing our need for a Savior and our own inability to be that so that we might, by faith, trust in Christ and be born again unto new desires, a new life, a new purpose. One of the sweetest things that we gain in Christianity and in our faith is we now have a purpose that's no longer bound to this world. My purpose is no longer bound to temporal things. When I look at raising my children, do I want them to learn to read? I do. I did. They did. I want my grandchildren now to learn that, right? I, I, we do want those things for them. I don't want to negate that, but at the end of the day, I have a bigger purpose than even that. I have a larger purpose, an eternal purpose in the life of my children, in the life of, of, of my friends and family. I have a purpose that's no longer bound to things which are temporal and can be taken. Right? Economies can take. My, I've talked to so many young families. I talked to one recently who had literally done every, worked two jobs, neglected. They didn't go on vacation. They did everything they could. They saved up about $60,000 so that they could, they could put a down payment on a house. They had saved up, I think it was 40 or 60. I forget what it was. And they were ready, right? That was sufficient in 2018 or 19 for them to be able to buy a house in Martin County and, and to be able to have a down payment and, and, and move into that house and do all whatever they needed to do. Well, come 2020, it wasn't sufficient anymore, right? Everything that they had done, it had shifted further. Now, I was going to use an elk hunting illustration, but I used the housing one because I thought it might be a little bit, I'm learning. I keep forgetting my audience a little bit. Well, I don't forget my audience, but I'm a little bit limited. But there's a moving reality to the temporal things we pursue in this life not so with christ and not so with with those things so listen to what he says about our union with christ on page 57 and following uh, just consider how many times in the in the middle paragraph or the the next to last paragraph on page 57 it says this the concept of the believer's union with christ is especially important in the teachings of paul his usual shorthand expressions for union with Christ are in Christ, in him, and in the Lord. British author John Stott says those three expressions occur no less than 164 times in Paul's letters. For our purposes of answering the concern that too much emphasis on God's grace may lead to irresponsible sinful behavior, the doctrine of the believer's union with Christ is the basis upon which Paul refuted that charge in Romans 6. In other words, it's our union with Christ that makes the, the, the freeness of grace not a danger to licentiousness. It's not a danger. He said in chapter 5, verse 21, that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Wonderful, amazing statement. That ought to make us want to jump up and sing if you're a believer here tonight. However, what it also does, or the fear is, is that it will create some mindset that says, well, shall we sin so that grace may have, if grace is so wonderful, and grace is, is brought about by sin, then shouldn't we sin more? And that's what Paul's saying in Romans chapter 6, absolutely not. And the way in which he does it is on the basis of because we are united with Christ. That's the reason that he can say that. It's such an important aspect to recognize. Turn over to page 58. So this is where, this is where it gets a little bit more in-depth. And I don't want that to be scary. I do not want you all to be afraid of the depth of Scripture. These are big truths. That's okay. Big truths because it's a big God. It's not, don't, don't be scared of the, the, the fact that God 
doesn't fit in our collective imaginations the way we think he should. Don't be scared that God doesn't, doesn't fit where, where we can put him in our finite brains and come to all the conclusions and have it figured out. Don't be scared of that. If, this is the best way I can say it, and I'm only speaking about me, so no one be offended. If God fits in my pea brain, he ain't God. If God can fit in my brain, then I have no real basis to worship him. Truly, it doesn't function that way. And so there's a measure. As we get into these deeper truths, don't be scared of that. He does a wonderful job. Now, you might have to read this chapter twice. You, I've read it twice. You might have to read it three times. You might read it five times and still be wrestling with truth. What a, what a good day that is. right? If there's a measure on any given day that you're wrestling with a truth from Scripture, that's a good day. That's a good day. And so don't be afraid of those things. So he's talking about representative union. Some people call it federal headship. It's got all kinds of different terms. But he does a really good job of walking through what he means, and that is that we have a representative that we're united with at birth. His name is Adam. You might be familiar with him. He's spoken of quite frequently at the beginning of the book. Adam. And so the understanding of that, he, does, it's a, he drew circles. I'm like, this is genius. He drew circles, and he drew one a little bit bigger than the other, and that's that picture we were talking about. All of humanity is in Adam, right? All of humanity is in Adam, but only some of humanity is in Christ. Not all of humanity is in Christ. And that's a common teaching on the pages of Scripture. It's not something new. He tells us that on page 58, every human being except Christ was born into the circle of Adam. Every person who trusts in Jesus Christ as Savior is born, I would say born again, into the circle of Christ. And, and that's just a good foundation for starting to understand that. It's the recognized picture of this. Jump over to page 59. The really good news, however, at the bottom of page 59, and the main point Paul is driving home is that just as Adam was our federal representative in what? In his sin. Right? That's what we that's what we inherit from Adam. The picture that's given in Genesis chapter 5, when it goes through the genealogies and it says that, that, that Adam bore a son in his own likeness, it's simply the picture. I, I use all kinds of different illustrations, but picture a, a cake mold. And, and and you've had the cake mold for, for 20 years and, and it's it serves you well, you're used to it, it works great. And one day when you're teaching your daughter how to use that cake mold, she dropped it and put a dent in it. From that day forward, every cake that comes out of that mold is going to bear that mark. right? Something impacted that mold sufficient to leave a mark, and that mark now carries forth into everyone after that. Romans chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5 makes abundantly clear this is what all of humanity now experiences. This is an important theological truth because so many times People believe that we are sinners because we've sinned. And that gives license to measure my sin against your sin and determine if I'm really in as much trouble as you're in. Right? That's where that struggle comes from. That's not the picture. According to Romans 5, what we're learning here, according to that, we sin because we're sinners. Because of that mark on the mold that Adam passed on to all of us, we come out sinning or as sinners who are going to commit sin. That's, that's the nature of humanity. And that's an important truth. That has so many implications. But the ones I want us to understand here is that just as Adam's sin brought condemnation and death to all his race, that is all human beings except for Christ, so did our Lord's act of righteousness bring justification and life to all of his race. That is all who trust in him, right? Small circle, big circle. Everyone clear on that? I think that's a wonderful way to explain what oftentimes is a very difficult subject. You'll probably hear that again when we get to Romans 5 in our exposition on Sunday morning. I might have to bring the circles up there for everybody. It's just a really great way to understand what oftentimes is very difficult to understand. He goes on, look at the bottom of page 60. All this discussion of Christ's federal representation on behalf of his people may seem like needless theological fine print to some people. 
but in reality, it's one of the most exciting teachings of Scripture. I have been, meaning the author, has been asserting from the very beginning of this book that our day-to-day -day standing before God, as well as our eternal destiny, is based not on our performance, but upon our Lord's performance. The only truth that makes that argument valid is that Jesus performed as our legal representative. That's the sufficiency of the work he did at the cross. That's what we need to understand. His sufficiency is not sufficient for every sin we committed prior to conversion. His sufficiency is for every sin, period. God doesn't look at us and suddenly say, okay, this one just came alive at 19, so I've forgiven all of their debt they had accumulated till then, but now they're on their own from 20 till heaven. No, by no means. But can we not recognize how easily that grips us? We are a performance-driven creature. We are performance-oriented, and it creates such disastrous consequences. Like I said, it drives sin not to the cross. It drives it underground. It drives it to a place where we hide it and don't contend well with it until it finally overwhelms us, and then we don't know what to do with it. Looking over on page 61, he says simply this, uh, at the middle of the first paragraph, our entire confidence and our acceptance before God is based solely upon the fact that Jesus was our legal representative in his sinless life and his obedient death. Now, he's going to explain a truth that I think is so simple, but we struggle so much with it. And some of the struggle to be fair and clear, has been because there hasn't been clear teaching on this in a lot of, a lot of circles and a lot of generations. And that's the difference in sin's reign and sin's dominion. Listen at the bottom of page 61. All that I have said, the author speaking, about our union with Christ and his death may seem like a digression, but it is necessary in order for us to finally address what Paul meant when he said that we died to sin. To answer the question, we need to go back to a statement in Romans 5.21 that sin reigned in death. Sin is personified by Paul and viewed by him as reigning over us in a kingdom of death. Why did sin reign? The answer is because of our guilt in Adam. The penal consequence of our guilt was to be delivered over unto sin as a legal reign. And the result of that was to be brought under the dominion of sin. The penal or punishment reign of sin and its corrupting dominion in our lives are inseparable and equal in context. Now, I know. I said don't be afraid. There's some, there's some deep words and in, 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 in contrary to our flesh realities of what we're dealing with. It's going to get simple in just a moment, but we have to walk through that. And he brings us to a verse that so oftentimes is, is, is a pinnacle point of struggle for so many people. When David in Psalm 51, the psalm of his repentance declares that surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now, there's been so much argumentation over that verse, and it's really not hard when you look at it through the lens of what Romans chapter 5 is teaching us. This recognition of our headship of, of Adam over our lives, our inheritance from him, that's all he's saying is, I was born under Adam's sin. I was born under the reign of death. I was born into the kingdom of death because of the sin of Adam. Is everyone tracking with just the language at this point, we're going to get to the explanation a little bit more fully. He goes on with a little bit more understanding, and he says this in the middle of page 62. To die to sin then means, first of all, to die to its legal or its penal or punitive reign, and secondly, as a necessary result, to die to its dominion over us. Now, we speak of the total depravity of a person who is outside of Christ. It's a wonderful description he gives here. We don't mean by that that the person is as wicked as he or she can possibly be, but that sin has corrupted the person's entire being. Guilt, in its penal consequence, is the source and ongoing cause of this depravity. This has so many ramifications or implications for how we view this. Very simply put, because all of us are born into sin under Adam's representation, because of that, all of us bear the weight of sin. Bear the weight of sin. Now, I got a lot of mamas in here, and so he doesn't address it, but I'm going to have to really quickly. What does that mean for a child, an infant, uh, who dies before birth or directly after birth? How can we say that there are those, that everyone is born into sin, 
But how does that then cross over for children who die before what we would call or has been called the age of accountability? And that's a really important question that gets a lot of really bad answers. I actually had a pastor one time that I was sitting in a men's Bible study, and that question came up, and he went into some kind of a thing about the election, the elect of God, that when they come into his presence at judgment, they begin to glow. And he went off on some kind of, I didn't understand where he was going. I still don't understand what he meant. And I use that just to say there's a lot of different things used to try and explain this. <clears throat> and people struggle with it. Because if you've been in our church service recently, you've heard me walk through what happens to the one who never hears the gospel, right? That hell was created for the punishment of sin through the sinner being punished, that God created it for that. Therefore, he is righteous for all men if they went to hell. All, all of humanity is deserving of his condemnation because all of humanity, as we're learning, is sinners. However, God in grace made a way through the gospel. So hell was not created for those who reject the gospel. Hell was created for the punishment of sin. God gave the gospel as a means to avoid the righteous or deserved punishment that our sin brings upon us. So when I say to people that those who never hear the gospel still stand righteously condemned as sinners, they naturally then make the leap to, well, what's the difference between that person and an infant? If they're born sinners, from the time of their conception, they're sinners, What's the difference? It's the difference between moral inability and physical inability. If there's a person in the Congo, just to use that example of the deepest, darkest part of whatever jungle that's never heard the gospel, I can go and preach the gospel to them, and they can trust in the Lord. I can preach the gospel till I'm blue in the face and lose my voice to a three-month-old, and they physically cannot do that. Is everyone clear on the distinction? So when you ask, well, what does that mean for children? Instant heaven. That's what that means, right? I believe that to the core of who I am for a multitude of reasons that we can't even fully get into tonight. But based on God's reason for creating hell, uh, based on God's character as displayed, based on the distinction in moral and physical inability, please understand those distinctions. So do I believe children are born sinners? I do. Does that mean that God condemns them in the same way? I don't. Okay, everybody clear on that? That's I, I know. I, he doesn't address that, and there is no way that I was going to leave that one hanging out there for everyone to ask me later. Uh, the, what do we believe? Is everyone clear on what we... All right, perfect. With that, let me get back to where we're at. When we speak of the total depravity, we're talking about that the person has entirely, their entire being has been corrupted. It doesn't mean that they're as bad as they can be, but it means that there's no part of them that can't be bad. Does that make sense? Okay. Guilt and its penal consequence is the source and ongoing cause of this depravity. Therefore, deliverance from guilt and its penal consequences brings deliverance from the dominion of sin as well. Listen to this explanation in that next sentence, two sentences away. There is no such thing as salvation from sin's penalty without an accompanying deliverance from sin's dominion. This obviously does not mean we no longer sin, but that sin no longer reigns in our life. And so the picture is that when Christ died on the cross, he came under the legal ramifications of sin. That he died to sin. Right? He never sinned, so it doesn't mean that he, in the way that we're fighting to put to death earthly things, that's not the picture of Christ. Christ never had to fight to put to death things which were earthly. He was the only human being after Adam and Eve that was born without that, already established in his life. That's an important understanding. It's, so when it says that he died to sin, speaking of Christ, what it's saying is that he died to the legal penalty of sin. He died to the legal reign of sin through our federal union with him and his death, meaning we who are in that smaller circle by faith in his finished work, we also died to the legal reign of sin. That's where we get the word justification. All that that's saying, ladies, all that that's saying is that through the finished work of Christ, we who are guilty are now declared justified. The legal penalty, the debt 
that our sin has wrought before a holy God, he paid. That's what that means, okay? Now for our sanctification, right? That's the ongoing. Now we're all saying, now what do we, how do we live in light of that? And how does that function? Well, the question arises if we died, uh, middle of page 63, to sin's dominion, why do we still struggle with sin in our daily lives? When Paul wrote, we died to sin, how can we live it any longer? He was referring not to the activity of committing sins, but to continuing to live under the dominion of sin. <clears throat> the word live means to continue in or abide in. It connotes a settled course of life. To use Paul's words from Romans 8, 7, the sinful mind, one which is under sin's dominion, is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. But the believer who has died to sin's reign and dominion delights in God's law. The believer approves it as holy, righteous, and good, even though he or she may struggle, may struggle to obey it. And here's the key. I really want you to hear this. We must distinguish between the activity of sin, which is true in all believers, and the dominion of sin, which is true of all unbelievers. This is what Paul's been hammering in our study of Romans 1 and 2 and in chapter 3 this coming week. It's the heart. It's the heart. It's, and that's what we're going to see as we go a little bit further. Uh, John Owen, Sinclair Ferguson, quoting John Owen at the bottom of page 63 uh, the last sentence of that says this, that while the presence of sin can never be abolished in this life, nor the influence of sin altered, its tendency is always the same. Its dominion can indeed must be destroyed if a man is to be a Christian, if a man is a Christian. That's the distinction. At the top of that page or that first paragraph, we have this statement. We indeed do sin. And even our best deeds that we accomplish are stained with sin, but our attitude toward it is essentially different from that of an unbeliever. All right, is everyone tracking with the transition he just made? A true believer has a new attitude because they have new life. The, the best way I can describe this is, is as an unbeliever, my only hold back from sin was consequences. That was it. If I thought I could get away with it, if I wanted to do it, and I thought I could get away with it, I'd jump with both feet, right? If I wanted to do it, and I thought I could get away with it, I'd jump with both feet, right? That's the picture of an unbeliever that we leap into. A believer is one who falls into. Now, to give you the best and clearest picture I can or an illustration, imagine if you find yourself in a strange place. You're, you're traveling on the road, and you're staying in a hotel and it's not your familiar home or other things. And you're going to be there for four or five nights. You're, you're there visiting family or whatever, and you're going to be there. And in the middle of the night, you get up to get a glass of water out of the restroom, and you don't know where the furniture is. And so you trip over the couch that's sticking out, and you fall and literally bust your nose on the, on the corner of the bathroom door. Now, what's the sane person going to do? They're either going to move the couch, they're going to leave the light on in the bathroom with the door cracked. They're going to figure out some way that they don't have that same experience the next night. Does it make sense? That's the picture of what it's like for a believer when they find themselves in sin. It's not, I don't, I don't like this. It didn't go at all like I wanted. I don't know what I was thinking. I need to correct this. I can't continue in this. This is bad. This is not what it's supposed to be. It's a very different thing than, well, I didn't get caught. Do it again. I can get away with this, right? The consequences versus a heart before the Lord that's died to sin. It's a very distinct thing. And that's the picture he's given. Listen, I love this statement. To paraphrase Ferguson on John Owen, the second or the bottom of the first paragraph on page 64, our sin is a burden that afflicts us rather than a pleasure that delights us. There it is, ladies. That's the distinction that this entire chapter is making. And it's a very important distinction. A believer cannot therefore live, listen to that terminology, cannot live in sin. If a man lives in sin, he is not a believer. This goodness is so important. If we view sin as a realm or sphere, then the believer no longer lives in that realm or sphere. 
This is, this is where we fight, ladies. When we talk about putting to death what's earthly, when we talk about fighting sin, this is where we fight. In the area where he says we succumb to temptations, this is where we fight. Our desires are already changed. Our desires are already changed. So we identify the danger to our own new desires being in Christ. We identify the weapons of our warfare, both those which are defensive. I think of Ephesians chapter 6, the armor that we put on, and those which are offensive. I think of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and, and where it talks about that our weapons are not carnal but mighty that we labor in these areas both defensively girding up and putting on the armor upon our feet and covering our chest and our head and giving the physical understanding of how we do that, that's where we fight. He goes on, and I would give you this just for a little bit of an understanding on page 65 at the top when he says, not only are we dead to sin, but we are also alive to God. Let me give you a, a just a basic Singular word understanding of that. Dead to sin, repentance. Alive to God, faith. Right? Repentance we turn from. Faith we turn to. Right? Repentance we turn from sin. Faith we turn unto Christ. That's the picture of simply what that means. It's just the picture of being born again. It's the picture of the receiving of the gospel and its accomplished work in our life. We don't have time, but John 15 is a wonderful place to look. Turn with me to page 66. He explains how that Christ is in us at the top of page 66. Christ enters into our humanity through the indwelling of his Holy Spirit to renew us and to transform us more and more into his likeness. Now, he makes a good distinction. There's, the, there's not a good earthly representation that we can look to to understand fully all aspects of what Scripture teaches. There's not a way to give you an earthly illustration that completely and perfectly uh, illustrates the Trinity. It doesn't exist in our world that we can point to that. Well, in the same way, when you consider this, the same thing we have to remember is this. The dependence, however, look in the middle or the end of the first paragraph on 66. Our dependence is not like the dependence of a child on his or her father for support. The child is not in the father. Our dependence is like the dependence of the branches on the vine for both life and nourishment. That's that John 15 picture of Christ being the vine and us being the branches that are attached. At the bottom of it in page 66, in that Next to last paragraph, Paul opened Romans 6 with a resounding reputation of the notion that the gospel promotes irresponsible, sinful behavior. He showed not only that it does not, but that it is not, but that it is the very nature of the gospel to ensure that such a thing, listen to this, ladies, cannot happen. I want you to hear that. That is absolutely beyond essential to our understanding of salvation, to our understanding of the gospel to our understanding of the lives that we live, to our understanding of, of judgment. I hope everyone heard that with clarity. What Paul is saying in Romans chapter 6, it is not possible for one who is in Christ, having been buried with him in the likeness of his death, by faith, symbolically represented in baptism, not that baptism has anything to do with this other than the symbolism it represents of an already finished work, being represented externally, but that is the picture that's being given. It's not possible for a person who has Christ in them to live in the reign of sin. To, is everyone clear on that? That's so confusing in our generation. I, I'm constantly, people ask me, and, and they'll want to come to me and say, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really, how do I know if I'm a believer? And then they'll say things like, I believe in Jesus, but you know, I like a lot of the world, and I've really lived for the world for a major portion of the last 20 years of my life, or 10 years of my life, or whatever it is. How, how do I know if I'm in Christ? What? That's the picture. How do you deal with sin when confronted with it? How do you deal with what God's Word has said? Do you defensively try and hide it, stick it in your pocket, make sure no one sees it, and clutch it so you can carry it with you into the next day? Or do you let go of it 
by the finished work of Christ on the cross when it comes to pass that you recognize having seen it on God's through the power of his spirit on the pages of his word or in the confrontation or encouragement from a fellow sister or brother or whatever form that God brings that, what do you do with it when it arrives? Now, we must be something new before we strive to do something new. This is a major component of Christianity. I, I'll tell you, so, so we've been had just wonderful opportunities lately to, to share the gospel with people who don't know the gospel. We pray for those opportunities, and sometimes we have more. It's just been a season when it seems like the Lord's brought that. And one of the areas is we've had a, a few folks who, for whatever reason, have said, tell me more, which isn't always the case, but it has been in a few situations. One of the areas that I've had to labor in uh, is I've had to go to those people and say, listen, I'm thankful you've been listening to sermons and been studying your Bible, but I want to make clear, have you truly trusted in Christ? Do you understand the gospel? Before you start trying to live the Christian life, has the Christian life become a reality inside of you? Like, what are you looking for in, in this area where you're trying to live a better life? Do you just want fewer consequences? Do you just want to want to have a better, more peaceful life? What? Because none of those things are, are, are the picture of why we come to Christ. Right? I want to make sure before you start striving to clean up your act or whatever, that the gospel is the purpose, the basis, and the foundation for that, or else I am just setting you up for greater destruction, for greater failure and fall. Now, many people think that's a horrible way to share the gospel, right? I, I would simply give you this picture. How many of you are familiar with the account of the rich young ruler? Everybody, to some degree, the rich young ruler is on the pages of Scripture in the New Testament, um, and he is a wealthy, rich, young person of influence, man of influence amongst the Jewish people. And he comes to Jesus and he says to him, I want to follow you. Now, I just want you to think about this. What would be the modern response? If we have a wealthy, young man of influence who comes and says, I, I want to be a part of this ministry. We'd be like, pray this prayer and let me sign you up. Hey, let me teach you about the ways that you can serve in these things, right? That would be the normal, right? Well, have you trusted in, in Jesus? Let, let's just get that out of the way so we can move on to greater things. But what did Jesus do? He did a hor Jesus was a horrible evangelist by the modern standards of our day. I'm serious. The rich young ruler came. This wealthy, young man of great influence came and said, I want to be one of your disciples, Jesus. And Jesus Jesus gave him the very truth that turned him away, saddened. Instead of just saying, well, let me tell you how to sign up, which is the modern response all too often. And it was an uncommon form. Others came to him and said, Jesus, I want to be your disciple. And Jesus said, well, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but if you follow me, you will have neither. Are you sure you want to do this? He warns us in Luke chapter 14, count the cost. Like I said, by today's modern standards, Jesus was the worst evangelist ever. And it kind of shows. I mean, at the time of his death, he had less than 500 followers. With three years of daily ministry, with miraculous strength and power and perfect wisdom and other things, he had fewer than 500 followers. So we need to see rightly where this struggle leads us and understand that, that there is no measure where I am calling you, where the Bible is calling you, where Paul is calling you, or anyone should be calling you to live the Christian life until you are the Christian. That has to be, we are called by the gospel to be something before it ever calls us to do something. And that's so essential to our understanding. For how you raise your children, what I was talking about this week, deal with them at the heart. Please deal with them at the heart. Here are some areas to think through. What are some human excuses for those who still live under the reign of sin, in the sphere of the reign of sin? constantly going back to the same choices, constantly pursuing after the same thing, all the while declaring, I don't want to do this. What are some of the excuses that are common in our day? Okay, yeah, that's, that's how God made me. I can't help it. Such a contradiction, yeah, it's such a contradiction to everything in Scripture. Here are some that I hear regular. It's someone else's fault. Someone I... 
I, I don't want to be this way, but, but you know, this is, this is how life has caused me to be. It's someone else's fault. Uh, here's a big one today. It's an illness. I, I don't want to do these things. I'm just, I'm just sick, right? I have oppositional defiance disorder <laughs> or whatever it might be, whatever the new thing. And there will be a new thing, right? There will be a new thing. And that's a, that's a common excuse for people to still live under the reign of sin. It, is God's word, is God's truth, did God somehow send salvation in such a way that it can cover everyone but those who have stronger temptations than others? Is there anyone for whom the grace of Christ is not sufficient? I don't believe so. And so there's no one who can say, I want God's grace, but it's not sufficient to free me from my sin. No. Now at the same time, it doesn't mean that we won't have to struggle and fight against sin daily. But for someone to say, I'm living under the sphere of sin, no. That's not possible. Another excuse that comes up, uh, it's too hard. I tried, but it's just too hard. It's just too hard. I can't, I can't. It's too far to drive. It's too late at night. It's too much temptation. It's just too hard. Scripture doesn't make that allowance. I wish that it did. Paul says in, in Romans chapter 9 that if he could, he would go to hell so that his countrymen, his kinsmen according to the flesh, would not. But he doesn't have that option. So please understand, I'm not up here saying these things because there's some measure where, where it benefits me or where I, I have some glee in saying them. I believe them to the core of who I am. I believe them to the depth because if I don't believe what this says, what am I doing? And this is clear in that. Yes, I'm going to have to do more of this chapter next week. <laughs> There's no way we can just rush through this. We're close, and so I am going to kind of rush through it, but we'll drop back and pick up, pick up some of this next week to go into next week. I know, I've, I've heard. I'm listening. I've heard. Um, so going on to page 67, uh, he talks about this, and, and we can look at one of my favorite places to look to understand about not letting sin reign and how he see, uses the same expression in both the indicative, which is a statement of fact, and the imperative, which is a statement of command. Uh, he, he gives us, for example, in Galatians 3.27, he said, all of you who were baptized into Christ have closed yourself with Christ. This is simply a statement of fact. It's an indicative statement. This is what's happened. It's not a command to somehow put clothe yourself with Christ. And he's just saying, this is what's already happened. However, in Romans 13.14, he exhorted us to clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is an imperative command. Hey, this is common. Look with me at Colossians chapter five, or chapter three, sorry, verses one to five, and we'll kind of wrap it up with this. He gives us the imperative, if we've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Now, this is not a new command. Jesus said, seek first my kingdom, and all these things will be added on you. This is not a new command. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, none of the things that are on earth. And then he tells us why. For you have died, past tense, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed to them in glory. Now look at verse 5, though. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. Now I think that that's a, a little bit of a mistranslation in the NASB. It's better translated, the ESV translates it and says, put to death that which is earthly. Not consider them as dead, put them to death. And, and the imperative in the verbal form that's there in the Greek bears that out more fully. And, and so what he's saying is, therefore, put to death. Kill the members of your earthly body. In what way? Well, put to death immorality, impurity, passion. So think of these things for just a moment. He just said you have died with Christ, therefore now put to death the things that are, which are earthly. That's not a struggle 
if you view it through the lens of your adoption and justification, Christ has purchased you, adopted you, justified you. You are now in Christ, smaller circle. You're outside the reign of the dominion of death or sin, which came through Adam, and you're now under the dominion of Christ. In light of that, put to death the things which are in opposition to Christ. Right? That's, that's the nature of it. We overcomplicate this. When I got married, I ceased to be single. Now, I'm not talking about like sinful things that are no longer a part of my life. I'm just talking about I no longer get to determine which lights get left on in my house because it's no longer just my house. It's our house, right? I, I don't get to determine how many pillows are on the couch, <laughs> right? When I got married, things changed. And now I live in light of that change, but I still have to fight. Don't think that I don't go sit on the couch and I'm not frustrated by the... I'm just kidding. <laughs> but seriously, see the difference? It's already happened. I've agreed to it. The change has happened. But now I have to live in the reality of the change. And unlike Christ, by golly, so does she. Right? Believe me, she would not have to clean the floors as often if it wasn't for me. Right? There are realities that she's accepted when she married me, but now she has to live within because she's married to me. Everybody tracking with that? All right, I'm going to pray and send you to get your children before I get in trouble. Uh, but let's, let's end with that, and we'll pick this up next week. But I encourage you, if you haven't read this chapter, please do. And if you have read it, read it again. It really is. The, the illustration he gives of the Russian defector, solid gold understanding, really simplifies it. So please... Uh, read that. I encourage you in it, and we'll see you next week, Lord willing. Uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your kindness, your provision, and your grace. And Lord, we know that these things have been given to lead us to repentance, that we would never presume upon them. So Lord, I pray that tonight uh, that we would be more uh, conformed to your image and that this would bring glory to your name. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.